<clears throat> so in any case, so I had gotten through the Quran. I'd gotten to the stage where I had all these rational objections to belief in God, and I spoke about these last night. And by the time I was done reading it, I no longer had them. I had this dilemma of trying to f figure out how this author of the Quran faced this picture, fit this picture. I had a hard time doing that. And I was all done fit, uh, reading the Quran, had these questions about authorship, and I went over to my friend Mahmoud Kandil's house one night, and I had, uh, he invited me over for dinner. And his sister let me in, and, I, and she told me to sit on the couch while Mahmoud came out, because he was in the shower. <clears throat> And while I was sitting there, I was listening to a tape. And Mahmoud had a tape on the uh, stereo. And Mahmoud, he used to love music. Rock and roll, jazz, rhythm and blues, classical. He was a great music lover. But tonight on the tape, <clears throat> he had a tape of this music that was coming out of the Quran that had no musical accompaniment, no instrumental accompaniment. It was just a single voice. And it was, to me, it sounded like it was singing. And it was singing in the most strangest and most, in a, in a very strange and haunting way. <clears throat> and it had a very strong and powerful cadence and rhyme. And it had a definite musical quality or rhythm to it, a natural inborn rhythm. And I was listening to it again and again and again, and I noticed that it would suddenly shift from one very strong, powerful rhythm and rhyme to a completely another one for a long while. And then it would shift again to another and another. It had a very haunting, powerful, strained, and intricate cadence, and a, and a structure, and no musical accompaniment, and this just this powerful intonation with this powerful rhyme and this powerful inborn rhythm. And when Mahmoud came out, I asked him, Mahmoud, what is that music you're listening to? And he quickly flicked off the tape. And he told me, uh, it's not music. And I said, well, then what is it? And he says, it's the Quran. I've been to that point in my life, I had never heard the Quran. I had read in a translation, and I thought it was powerful and compelling and beautiful. I thought it was philosophically great, tremendously rational, coherent, deep and profound, but I had never heard it recited. But when I heard it recited for the first time, I thought, I said to Mahmoud, is it all like that? Does it all have such a powerful, innate rhythm and this very intricate and powerful rhyme? And Mahmoud said, uh, yes. And I said, is it poetry? And he said, no. I said, then what is it? He said, Arabic, po Arabic po poetry has a very definitive style. And this is not anything like Arabic poetry. Normally, when I used to have conversations with Mahmoud about his faith, I used to, I would usually file, you know, keep on going and asking him more questions. But at that point, I asked him nothing else. Because I just needed to sit there and try to piece all the pieces together. Because when you study literary works, poetry, for example, that has tremendous rhythm and tremendous rhyme and very uh, strict structure, usually when you translate it, that into another language, it loses much of its power. The meaning becomes almost trite. But here we have something that has the most powerful, intricate, disciplined rhythm and rhyme throughout the entire Quran. And when you translate it into my language, it's still beautiful, powerful, compelling, rational, deep. I couldn't believe that the same thing I was reading could possibly be the same thing I heard in Arabic. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. You will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up as, with snow. If you translate that into Arabic, I'm sure the Arabs in the audience are not going to think that's really great or profound. But it's a beautiful poem in English. It was in just sunny clime where I used to spend my time, a servant of, his majesty, the, of Her Majesty the Queen. And of all that black-faced crew, the finest man I knew was a regimental bisti gungadine. Right? Famous poem, right? But if you translate that into Eng to another language, it'll lose much of its compelling beauty, you know, much of its power. But this, the Quran, which had this powerful rhythm, systematic rhythm, this innate rhythm that makes it so easy to memorize even, 
that, that has this beautiful and powerful and compelling music and rhythm throughout it and rhyme that shifts and changes. It's not even consistent. One sora it'll be this way, another sora, maybe a long one, will start this way and then slowly glide into another and then slowly glide into another and then slowly glide into another. You know, most great poets when they write, they write in two or three meters in rhythms and that's it. And all their poems are in one or the other. This one is shifting dramatically and intricately throughout the high, entire Quran. There might be 150, maybe 200 different meters and styles and rhythms and rhymes throughout the Quran. I thought, how can this author do this, coming from the environment that he did? How could he produce something this, this magnificent? Especially it's coming from a very primitive, simple, simple unrefined, un backward, primitive society. I thought he either must have transcended his time and space like no other person in the history of the world, or, I don't know, <laughs> I didn't know. Maybe there was a God, I wasn't really sure. Maybe I was wrong, maybe my mom was right, maybe there was a God. And that, through reading the entire Quran, and through these considerations, especially the ones I met, mentioned yesterday, but also just thinking about these issues as well, the doubt began to creep in. And the more I thought about these things, the harder time I had reconciling my encounter with the Quran with my commitment to atheism.